Given out uh, some certificates for those that have served on the Silver Set Council, and we have one more left. And uh, while he's on his way up here, John, we have a certificate here in the name of the members of the Silver Set Department. This certificate of appreciation is presented to you for your service and time dedicated to serving as a member of the Silver Set Council. So, you. well, you were there, okay? And thank you very much. Appreciate you. You were there. Sure. Francis has you on the rolls if you okay. were there. You bet. Thank you all very much. Thank it you. Was an honor. You can go that aisle and be a lot easier for you. Well, I want to say something to Jack. Oh, okay. Okay, now we'll turn it back over to Paul. Here he comes. <laughs> Paul. Well, I tell you, it's good to be back. Uh, you know, you can only stand so much of that, uh, what we were doing. Uh, we got back from. You know, from where were we? Switzerland, and it wore us out. <laughs> it took us two or three weeks to get back to normal, and and then my kids rented a beach house for four days, and w w Glennie and I are really not beach people, <laughs> and so, but I, I love sitting on the deck and watching the water come in. I'll have to admit that, but uh, but it's good to be back. It's good to be uh, you know back and. And doing what we we normally do, and getting back into uh, we're we're people that kind of get in a, a rut, if you want to call it, and we just we don't like to get out of that rut too long. And so we're talking. I know you enjoyed Kyle last week. Uh, uh, I now I reminded Kyle. Now Kyle, there's a 30 minute time slot that you have, so you know. Just do what you need to do <laughs> to stay within that 30 minutes. And he did pretty good, didn't he? And I, uh, I, but I, I'm, I really enjoy Kyle, and I know y'all did too. We, we, we studied, uh, you, you know, we studied Gideon the last time I was here, and and then he had a good one with Samson and and those things. And uh, you know, we've. I really enjoyed. Uh, Fran did some great ones out of Judges too, and I really enjoy those story type stories that we hear like that. And, and we got another one this morning, but but it's on David this morning. And I want to tell you that those of you that that like basketball, you know, once a year the NCAA has has a, a tournament that involves the whole United States, different schools, and. And it's called March Madness. You, you ever heard of that? March Madness, yeah. Well, it simply means that, that most times, and this is, this is the fun part, I'd love to, to pick on one of those guys that one little guy, the unexpected team goes far beyond what, what you expect them to. And, and we could name a few, but uh, it, it's a situation like this where the term David and Goliath is used in that situation. Because a, a little guy knocks out a big guy. And, and this is what we see there. David was the ultimate physical underdog, but he was, had unbeatable support spiritually. Let me read you something that I, running across in, in this lesson. And I, did, I want to read you something from Second Chronicles. And this is very instructive for, for you and I. I just, this passage was written over 2,000 years ago. To people just like us. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Now the Spirit of God came on Azariah, the son of Obed. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and all Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For many days Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel and they sought him and he let them find him. Folks, that, that passes through the centuries as good advice for any civilization out there. And it does it today. When you think about where we're at in this world now, we want to do life without God. And, and you see it all over. Well, uh, you know, how can we say that? Because just look, 
Look at the world. Now we have people just blatantly going in stores, picking up an armload of stuff, and just walking out. No, and nobody, you, you confront them, and you're going to be the one that's locked up. Now, how, how weird is that? Uh, it, it's this type of life, and we're without God. And if we look for God, he will let us find him. Now, that, that's a strange statement, but Deuteronomy 4.29 but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. But we also know that seeking God is not always an easy thing to do, is it? Yeah, it's not because God is one off and hid anywhere. It's simply because our minds are so saturated with, with misconceptions about God and who he is and what he does and, and the seats planted by Satan in our own minds. Now, it's reinforced by the culture we live in that we need to do our own thing. We need to do that. And, and not to mention the sinful nature that we were born with, we still have. Our own hearts and the general deceitfulness of sin. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You know, I mean, you think the heart wouldn't be that way, but it is. Now, now we come to, uh, to see that, that there's a situation that we're getting into that Saul had acted out, uh, out of character, even for a king. And he'd made a mistake because he offered a sacrifice instead of waiting for the prophet to do it. He'd stepped out of line. Saul was king, but he was not a priestly line. And so 1 Samuel 13, 14 uh, I, I won't read that because it saved a little time, but, but what he simply was, he was waiting on Samuel to get back because the war was uh, increasing on him, and, and he got nervous, and so he went ahead and offered to sacrifice himself. And God said, uh, Samuel said, you've done a bad thing. Uh, you know, you, you're, and because of this, I have chosen a man after my own heart. Your, your kingdom will decease. And I've chosen a young man named David who's going to be the leader now and me. And, and what does it mean? And let me ask you this. We're going to get to David and Goliath. But what does it, he said he chose a man after his own life. What does it mean to you to seek after God's heart? What does it mean to you? If you were to seek after God's heart, what would it mean to you? What would you be doing? Reading his word, loving him. What else? Praying. Witnessing. All of those are true, aren't they? You know, it, 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 you know uh, I think it's uh, maybe John Piper that does a desiring God. I think that's his... Uh, one of his ministries there it means you search for god you you go on a journey you searching for him you're looking for him you crave for god like like now i crave for something sweet well that means you crave for god like that and or you pursue god literally pursue him and it, it means there's another scripture over in Acts. I think it's Acts 22 somewhere in there where Paul, is, I mean, uh, Luke is, is explaining something about uh, this whole thing with Saul. And, and he says this, that he chose one that's seeking after his own heart. I chose one willing to do all that I want him to do. If we pursue God, he's going to pursue us. He's going to be found by us. Because we're willing to do all God wants us to do. Now, we have grand imagination about what we might do, but not many of them are come to fruit, do they? And when we do that, when we search for God, it, it, it's almost always got to result in action. We have to be doing something. 
And it means that we should turn from our wicked ways, repent. I mean, give everything to God. Put God first in our lives. That's the problem we face today too much. We don't put God first in life. Yeah, God's part of our lives, but maybe we've got him compartmentalized over here somewhere. He's not first. Now, it's all about showing love and compassion in your heart for God. Let me just tell you, looking into this lesson today, we're starting in, in chapter 17 of, uh, I, th I think, First, uh, First Chronicles chapter 17. Now, he's, he's, Israel was at war with the Philistines. Matter of fact, you realize that's where, what's going on now in Hamas over there? That was the area of the Philistines in biblical days. I still contend that, that that's where some of the problem is. We didn't do what God said do. He said wipe them out. Take, take over that land and run all the Canaanites out. I don't know. They, that wasn't necessarily the Canaanite, but the whole area was, was Canaanites in some sense. Now, they were at war anyway with the Philistines. Philistines had 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers, Scripture says, numerous as sand. Now, now here, here's what happened at, when we get into this picture here this morning. There, there was two mountains. Israel is on this mountain over here. Philistines on this mountain over here. And right between them was the Valley of Elah. And they shouted at each other back and forth. Uh, I, I'm thinking about Bob Renfro. He's not here this morning. And, uh, but when he was cruising the Mediterranean, keeping, uh, keeping the world safe back at one day uh, as a Navy man, they passed a, uh, a bunch of uh, leathernecks, the Marines, on another ship. And they waved good, you know, have a good day, guys. This is the way they were shouting back and forth. And he tells that story better than I do, but I uh, can't imagine what it would be to shouting off the bow of a ship, and, and you'll never see those Marines again. But, uh, but they, they, they got in one anyway, and they talked about the Queen some and all that stuff. And so, but nonetheless, it, uh, it was a fun thing, and this is what was happening. They were shouting at them, and then Philistines would shout at them. And, and every day, Morning and evening for 40 days. There's, there's symbolism in all these 40s and all that stuff. Goliath would come out, and he would throw his insults to Israel, and he, and he would shout at them, and he would challenge them, and, and he, he would challenge Israel, send someone out to fight me. And this was, the, this was common, and this is what happened between warring armies. You didn't necessarily kill each other all the time. You would send one out to fight one of theirs. And whoever won lost the battle. I mean, they won the battle and the other one lost and one of them became the other. And that's what scripture says. Come out and fight me. And if you, if you beat me, then we'll become your servants. But if I beat you, then, then we, you're going to become our servants. And so, and that's, that's what that whole thing was about there. Now, this Goliath character, depending on what you consider in scripture a cubit that there's a little bit of confusion about that what a cubic is and what a span is this guy would be nine foot nine inches tall all the way up to 11 foot four inches tall folks this is like i think it's probably a 12 inch ceiling here 12 foot ceiling you just think about somebody that tall and, and, and I mean, he, the, the armor he covered himself with, this fish style armor, 175 pounds, they, they speculate. I mean, the spear weighed 17 pounds. The head of the spear weighed like 15 pounds. I mean, it, it seems crazy, but, uh, but you do know there was some, there was some giants in there. We talked about that when they went into the land. You know, the, these guys, when they surveyed the land initially, he said, oh, there's some giants there. There's some big dudes out there. So now we look at David as a young boy. Do you realize what they speculate his age was when all this was going on? Uh, 
the 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 one that they that several people sat around this idea that he was a teenager, somewhere thirteen to sixteen years old. Now they they do this by figuring out the brothers and all that stuff, and 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 of course they had some sisters too, but they never could figure out exactly where he fit in there. So thirteen or sixteen years old. Now I know. Some of you teenagers, when you were teenagers, you thought you could you could uh, climb tall buildings too, didn't you? And you were bulletproof. I don't know if David felt that way, but, but here we see this young boy named David, a teenager. Saul was still king when it's going on, and, and this Goliath continued to taunt the people over there. Now, who would have thought God would use a young boy to slay the giant? First uh, Samuel 17, let's just read a few verses in 1 Samuel 17, and uh, starting with verse 17. Now, then Jesse, that, that's his dad, then Jesse said to David, his son, take now for your brothers an epoch of the roasted grain and those ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also those ten cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand, and look into the welfare of your brothers, and bring back news of them. For Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistine. So David arose early in the morning and, and left the flock with the keeper and took their supplies and went to Jesse, as Jesse had commanded him. He went to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. David, he wanted, he wanted on the front line. He didn't want to have to be uh, what he was doing. And as he was talking with them, I think, I mean, don't read, I read over there just a little bit here. But now, well, let me go ahead and read it, because as he was talking to them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath, named Goliath, was coming up from the army of Philistine, and he spoke these words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. Well, David's three older brothers were serving in Saul's army there. They were there, and so Saul sent a, a care package to them. That was common then, that you kind of supplied the needs of the, of the unit out there while they were in the field, and so... And so we, we see that David was acting as a, a little shepherd and an errand boy to his brothers here. Now, now, what does it say about Israel's army that they would send a young boy to fight Goliath? <laughs> to me, it says that Samuel was, that was, he was only a young, untrained boy who believed in God and was able to fight. Now, we move on down a few of the verses, 17, starting with verse 32. When the words were, earlier he said this, because David asked the, the soldiers there, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Now, in, go down to verse 32. And when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, you're not able to go against him to fight for him, but you are but a youth while he had been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. <laughs> he killed a lion and a bear and it took a lamb from the flock. I went out there and attacked him and rescued him from his mouth. And when he arose against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. I mean, here's a guy that kills bears and, and lions. I mean, barehanded. And so, so we see here, Saul is trying to talk him out of it, David. You're, you're but a youth. You can't take this guy on. And so, David, see, Saul looked at David and saw his youth. He did not look at David and see his potential. David had the potential to, to do what he wound up doing. And he knew God could use his skills. He developed a lot of skills out there fighting this lion and the bear off of off the, 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 uh, his flock out there. 
Now, let's move on down a few other verses. They, they cover too many verses in here to do this story right, but 1 Samuel 17, verses 45. So he, he goes on, and he gets, he gets fixed up, and, and he gets the gear, and then he runs, and, and, uh, and, and he clothed himself with that. And, you know, and, he, and when he, he went out and picked up some, uh, he picked up five stones, and, and, and the Philistine, he came out, and he approached David. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, <laughs> uh, this, this guy is, is pretty tough in his own right. Now, 45 through 47. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hand, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all... And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. I, can you see a 13, 14-year-old boy talking to this giant that way? Uh, it, it tells you a lot about David right here. And, but he, he reminded that the victory would be the Lord's. It wouldn't be David. Uh, it was not based on a weapon he used, it, it, but, it, but on God's strength. And that scripture goes on to say that now David reminded Goliath that the battle was the Lord's. And, you know, it, it, God doesn't look on human ability. Keep this in mind when we think about when God asks you to do something. It does not concern itself with mundane thoughts such as, I can't, can't do that. Uh, well, it's never been done. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how. Well, why me, Lord? All of these things, it, it, when, when God tells you to do something, these thoughts don't come to mind. It simply says, faith says, Goliath, you're ugly, you stink, you're going to die because the Lord has already delivered you into my hands. I've seen a few people that might be that bold, but uh, I don't know if they ever carried it out or not. Let me tell you this. Uh, when we say something like that, I, I, have a, I have a bunch of pet peeves. You don't know the truth. One of them is when you watch sports, football, basketball, athletes, they, they win a big award, they, they do a good play, they score a touchdown, and they run out of that end zone, you know, pointing to God and all this stuff. Let me tell you something, guys. They point to the chest and beat, and with their lips they glorify God, and their lifestyle ignores God totally. I mean, this is, I, I, I just hate to see that. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, I talk to the TV sometimes. <laughs> and and I, I just simply, when I see that, I simply say, get back in there and do your job. I mean, this, this is, we just need to do our job and quit that kind of stuff. In reality, uh, you do what uh, we've seen some players do. That, uh, you know, they put these little crosses on their cheeks and they live their life in such a way that you know that it's real. But here's some guys that, that get out there and do that. Anyway, forget my pet peeve, but we cannot just glorify God with only words we speak you must you must David didn't just tell Goliath about his God he took action based on what God had told him based on what God was doing now we go on and, and we know this that it, it goes on to say then David said to the Philistines you come to me with a sword and a spear and I come to you in the name of the Lord David. and then he goes on 
And it said, Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to beat David. David ran quickly to battle. He ran at the guy, swinging his slingshot. Wham, wham. And, and we know that. It, uh, he took it from his bag. Philistine, there was one spot in his armor that didn't, wasn't covered, and it nailed him right here between the, the forehead, it says. And, you know, when, when you think about that, that uh, here we are with this, uh, all of this, and did it, did it just happen that that slingshot hit him where there was no armor? <laughs> no, no. Now, all of this, you see, God, God has done all this, God. And then we, we get on down to uh, verse 50, and then it says, Thus David... When he, when he hit him in the forehead, he fell on his face to the ground. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. He did not kill him with a sword. And what he did, though, he ran and drew the Philistine's sword and cut his head off. And it, the, the, the story goes on. You need to read the rest of this story. David carried that head around with him for a good while. He carried it to Jerusalem with him. And, and, uh, any, but anyway, we, we know that that's what happened. And, and, uh, you see, but then David says this, this is, this is where David's strength comes. And if you go to chapter seven of second Chronicles, David, David has a says a prayer. I'm going to read the prayer because there's too many verses to read, but it said, then David, the king went in and sat before the Lord and he said, who am I? O oh, Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? How many of you could say that? <laughs> I certainly can say that. Who am my Lord, that you've brought this far? He goes on to say, For this reason you're great, O oh Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and may the house of your servant David be established before you. And then finally he says, And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true. And you've promised this good thing to your servant. David understood that the kingdom was now his. And so we, David, David understood that all blessings come from God. Are we... Do we think we're just lucky sometimes, or do you believe all blessings come from God? You know, I don't believe in luck, if you don't know the truth. I believe it happens for reasons, things happen, and God blesses when he blesses. And, and when we're not on God's team, uh, you're not going to be blessed as often as you would. Now... Let me, let me just bring this some kind of conclusion here because it, it's an interesting thought. Someone had put it this way. Living at risk is jumping off the cliff and building your wings on the way down. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's faith, guys, if you do that. I mean, now, there, there was another thing. Why did he pick up five stones? There's been a lot of speculation about that, and, and I'm not going to speculate. I don't know why the five stones either, but there's two possibilities. One of them is five is a number of grace in the Bible. You remember when they said, may, so may sin abound so that grace may abound? It's, grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. Well, there was five stones, so it was more than sufficient, wasn't it? Now, the other thing is Goliath had four brothers. <laughs> there, was a bunch of, there was a bunch of guys down there. There was a bunch of giants down there. And I don't know if he thought maybe they might want to get involved too, so he picked up five stones for that. I don't know. It's a good thought that maybe, maybe that happened. But at some point, here's what David did, guys. David considered the cost, and he took the risk. You and I need to do that more in our lives with the Lord. You consider the risk and then take the risk. See, God doesn't focus on our outward action. He looks at believers' motivation of the heart and our inward commitment is dis it, it's, it's actually demonstrated by obedience. How do we know that God, you know, how does God know that we love him? Because we're obedient to him. 
we do those things. God is honored and glorified when the action of our heart reveal who we are. And this group would recognize the name Teddy Roosevelt. And I've only seen pictures and read stories. But he says this, Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered with failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Folks, if, 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 you're, if you're a Christian, you understand this gray twilight that Teddy Roosevelt is talking about. It's, it's not mysterious. It's not a, a, a elusive. It's called a lack of faith. We don't want to get involved because we may or may not can do it. So let's don't let's don't get in there. Let's don't get it. Uh, let's don't you, you know we don't suffer much that way, and we live in this no zone, and that's exactly what he's getting at. You we can risk the cost of the battle with the Lord. Mark nine twenty three says this: All things are possible to him who believes. Now, do we believe that we believe that or not? Let me. Uh, what do we? Uh, every lesson we do, you should take something away from it. If 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 you've studied your lesson and and we do, so what do we take away from this? Well, I, I know it, it. Psychologists use this as battling your giants and things like that, and maybe that's what we take away with it, but. But just think about it. If you're trying to do your own battle, are you trying to fight your way through this world? Well, then, are you trying to fight it your way or God's way? Are you trying to outsmart the enemy? Maybe you outfox him. You're smarter than the enemy. Well, reality, you can't do that, but God can. So David's eyes were not on the giant. David's eyes was on his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Lord out there said, it. you know, his eyes were focused. You know, when you think about David, really all you can say is, I, I know David's failures. We've studied that before and here many times. But when you look at David right now at 16 years old or whatever it was, you have to think, what a man. What a man that would trust God that much to go fight the giant someone as tall as this room. And I think, God, if, if we listen closely, God would be saying this to you and I, these very words, and I close with this. You do it my way, and I'll honor you. You do it your way, and you're doomed to fail. The battle is mine. I think that's exactly what God would tell us today. The battle is mine. And I have to believe with what's going on in Israel right now, the battle is God's. And it will be what it will be. Thank you, folks. Glad you all came today. And, and uh, Gary, I'm glad you're doing a little better. Virginia, I know you're doing better. And I'm going to rest you. And I, uh, and I see Shirley back there. Shirley, we're glad to see you here today. And we, we enjoy helping Shirley on the other side over there to, to pick up door and and uh, so anyway you all have a good day and let's go to Lord in prayer uh, Lord we just Lord it's simply because uh, why we don't fight battles the way we need to is because we just simply don't believe you would help us and it's a lack of faith Lord, we can't, we can't live our life that way. We have to step out sometime and trust you, knowing that the battle is yours. Lord, we thank you for that promise. We pray that we'll claim that promise more as these days go by. And Lord, whatever the, whatever the battle is we're fighting, that we'll trust you to guide us through it. And Lord, I just... Uh, I just pray for the many needs out there right now. And, and Lord, we'd be remiss not to lift up our, our precious pastor in, uh, in earnest. And I just call him pastor. I know I know where our pastor's Jim now, but Ernest has always just been pastor to me. And, 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 and God, I just pray you'll meet their every need. Lord, that you will just uh, cause some healing to take place. And put strength in their bodies and 
and uh, allow Ernest to get the rest he needs to continue to take care of Ann. And Lord, we love them, and we know you love them, and and uh, we just uh, trust you to their care. And and uh, and so, Lord, we just we just thank you for what you're going to do there. Lord, be with us for the remainder of this day, the remainder of this service, and and God may be you be honored in the process. We thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, folks. <laughs>